Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. There's a psalm that uh, expresses a very common problem we get ourselves into. It says in many places that a man digs a pit and then falls into it himself. Oh, we've all done that, I suppose. Things turn around and backfire on us. And that psalm speaks to a certain extent to certain aspects of tonight's guests journey to the Catholic faith. Father J. Scott Newman is here to talk about his journey of faith. Father Newman, uh, our paths crossed, kind of crossed, though not exactly, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But he's here to share his faith and to talk a bit about how his journey had a Pauline twist to it. And uh, he'll explain what that means in a bit. But I want to remind you that you're a very important part of the Journey Home program. If you have any questions tonight for Father Newman, give us a call. Start calling right now at 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can give us a call at 205-271-2980. Father Newman, welcome to The Journey Home. My pleasure, Marcus. Thank you. It's great to have you here. We have, we have a common friend, and uh, Father Garneau. Yes. That's right. Yes. But, uh, but like I said, our paths crossed a little bit. How was that? You now teach where I used to teach, That's at the Pontifical right. College Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. That's right. I teach uh-huh. catechetics, and what you used to teach there? Canon law and a little philosophy. <laughs> now, you're a, 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 a diocesan? Priest of the Diocese of Charleston, South Carolina. All right. Name and presently, parish? I'm pastor of St. Mary's Church in Greenville, South Carolina. All right. But you have a couple other hats that you wear also? Oh, uh, <laughs> priests and dioceses like mine all do three or four jobs. I'm director of continuing education for priests, uh, member of the Canon Law Society, um, an officer of the Society for Catholic Liturgy, a uh, multidisciplinary society for the reform of the reform. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. All right. life is busy. Well, it's great to have you here, Father. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Let's start as we do every week. I'd like to invite you to, to give a little snapshot of your your background. Your, sure. Where'd you come from spiritually? Well, I was born in a small mill town in the shadow of Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina, Elkin by name. And my father's family are primarily Southern Baptists. My mothers were half Baptist and half Church of the Brethren. Okay. And my upbringing was uh, a conventional um, Carolina life <laughs> until I was 13 years old. And um, as clear as day on the second Sunday, or the second Monday of June in 1976, I had an epiphany. (laughs) There is no God. Up to that moment, I had been sort of... Kind of an anti-epiphany. That's (laughs) right. I'd been groping my way toward, in an adolescent way, of course, uh, a view of the world that can only be described as scientific materialism. That is, there is no supernatural reality. All that is, is what can be seen and measured, uh, and we can know this by the scientific method. Mm-hmm. Um, was that as a result of a class or books you're reading? Well, or just it was a, a long, it was the culmination yeah. of a process, but the, right. the, the particular event was um, just, uh, the state of North Carolina conducted a little two-week uh, summer school for uh, bright kids who needed to be encouraged. Yeah. Uh, you're not odd because you like to read books. And they brought in a professor, a series of professors from the state universities. And the first one was a professor of philosophy, uh, whose specialty was the philosophy of religion. And as with so many academics in her discipline, she was an atheist. And as she explained uh, her approach to this discipline, the philosophy of religion, it was like tumblers turning over in my head. Of course there's no God. And from that moment until my conversion, Uh, in the fall of 1981, I was sincerely and absolutely Mm. convinced that there is no God. So for about five years, was that for you, when you look back, was that a freeing epiphany or did it lead to the despair that it often does for some folk? Uh, It it gradually led to despair. I wasn't aware of it uh, at the moment. But what I was left with was the kind of uh, humanism Um, that makes man a naked ape. Mm. There's nothing in that philosophy, there's nothing distinctively uh, human uh, about us. We're we're essentially no different than than cockroaches. Uh, A little higher in the evolutionary chain, Mm. but 
uh, that inevitably leads to some kind of despair, whether it's uh, murderous nihilism or debonair nihilism, it, yeah. it inevitably leads to nihilism. Okay. I flippantly started the program with that verse from Psalms about digging a hole. So you were given the spade. Now, uh, for the next five years, talk about that hole you dug. Well, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, 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 I was the village atheist, and I played the part with gusto. Uh, I enjoyed taunting my classmates in school. Uh, on more than one occasion, I made the girls cry by saying outrageous things. Uh, one occasion in the ninth grade, uh, a classmate gave me a Bible uh, saying that he was praying for my conversion. I said, no, 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 I don't want this, and he insisted. I said, if you give it to me, I'm going to tear it up and throw it away. And I did, mm -hmm. which of course created havoc in the classroom. Oh, especially in South Carolina there. Right, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I played this role uh, with relish, being the village atheist and the provocateur, and constantly attempting to convince my friends, my, my peers, hmm. that Christianity was superstitious nonsense. Were your parents uh, happy with this uh, chain of events? Or? No, they were not happy. B um, but they approached it with a, with, uh, a measure of wisdom, um, realizing that direct opposition was going only going to lead to more yeah. adolescent silliness. So the reaction was... Um, Hopefully this too will he'll, pass. He'll grow yeah. up and grow <laughs> out of it. Yeah. Did, the, did uh, that conviction that had so shaped you then uh, lead to your choice of college at this point? It did. Uh, most of my friends were going to schools in the South, places like Duke and Chapel Hill, and uh, I had an instinct to uh, flee the South like a burning building hmm. because it was, as Flannery O'Connor described it so beautifully, the Christ-haunted South. Hmm. And uh, I decided to go to Princeton and expected that I would make my life in the North as an atheist and a man of science. Hmm. Um, and it didn't turn out that way. Okay. All right. Talk us about uh, the bottom of the pit and uh, what well, happened. <laughs> my freshman year of college, uh, in order to fulfill a liberal arts requirement, but also um, out of curiosity, I took a course called Christianity and its Critics. And the reason I took the course was to prepare myself to do battle with Christians, yeah. to, to uh, understand the arguments and be prepared to refute all Christian yeah. belief. And instead, I found myself exposed for the first time in a serious way to Christian ideas, to the great Christian thinkers, to Augustine and Aquinas, for example. And I was, in grappling with their writings, finding myself uh, a bit with horror, <laughs> coming to a reluctant, um, grudging admiration hmm. for the clarity of thought and the, and the coherence of their belief. Um, and it was during that time that I began to wonder if my earlier rejection of Christianity was an entirely reasonable thing. Hmm. Did you... Uh We'll talk about the, the impact, the final impact of that then for you. Well, uh, during that year, there was just a class. It I mean, was just a class, yeah. but there were other things going on in my life. Okay. Um, early on, after arriving at the university, I discovered that most of my friends were serious Christians, hmm. almost evenly divided between Catholics and evangelicals. And they would speak to me about their faith, argue with me, um, suggest books to read, uh, my friend Bob Royal, who ended up being my sponsor in the church mm. some months later, uh, was constantly feeding me good books. Uh, Chesterton, Belloc, He's Newman. a Catholic author himself. That's right, yes. That's right. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was um, uh, in the habit of stopping into the Princeton Chapel, which is a masterpiece of, of mm. neo-Gothic architecture, mm. the Capo Lavoro of Ralph Adams Cram. And the reason I was going in was not to pray. I was stopping, at least I was telling myself this, I was yeah. stopping to admire the beauty of the building, which is right by the library. You have to pass the chapel to get to the library. Yeah. So in the evening, on my way to study, I'd go in to admire the beauty of the color in the glass and the texture of the wood and the stone. And in the spring of that freshman year, toward twilight one evening, I was sitting there alone, and I remember thinking, I know you're not there. 
And in the instant of the thought, I was aware of the paradox. Yeah. If he isn't there, then to whom am I speaking? Right. And I got up and ran for my life. <laughs> uh, well, did you get very far? I mean, uh, you're running for your life. Well, I, I didn't. Uh, s s the end of school was at hand. The summer began. And uh, toward the end of the vacation, I got the distressing news that uh, uh, one of my classmates, uh, who had shared a suite with me in the freshman year, had died of a heart attack. Um, a young, athletic, vigorous man in good health, but with a congenital heart defect. And his death was the first time in my life that I was really confronted with the fact of mortality. Hmm. When I was a child, of course, older relatives had died, but it didn't directly confront me. Now, here was a peer, a man of my own world, hmm. and he's dead. How do I reckon with this? And in the uh, opening that that provided, friends in the university, classmates, began to speak to me about their faith. Hmm. Uh, again, both Catholics and evangelicals. But the one in particular who, who saw the opening and, and, and used every opportunity was a man, uh, a, another Carolinian, a um, classmate of mine, who began to talk about his faith in a very personal way um, that I found compelling. And we began to read together St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And then came the fateful day. It was mid-October, the 15th. We'd been to supper, came back to my room, and uh, had reviewed those first beautiful verses of chapter 1 of Ephesians where Paul hmm. lays out the whole plan of salvation. And at the end of it, my friend Roger said, well, what do you think? I said, I, I wish I could believe that this is true. Hmm. I wish that I believe that this is a true account of reality, but I don't know how. And he said, I do. He asked me to kneel down and pray with him. Very awkwardly and reluctantly, I found myself kneeling on the floor of my dormitory room with my friend and classmate, Roger, and he began to pray. And I can't tell you whether it was 20 minutes or two hours and 20 minutes, but the entire experience was fire. You mean in a, in a purging sense? A, or a, a, purge, a purging or? fire, okay. an illuminating fire, a transforming fire, uh, fire. Hmm. And from that moment to this, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been the center of my life. Hmm. It was that night that the Lord Jesus laid hold of me, took possession of me, as Paul puts it, and nothing's been the same since. Hmm did it immediately get you into church? I mean, you had this powerful experience of Jesus. Well, I was confronted uh, on standing up from the floor with a question, what next? Where do I go? What do I do? And I briefly uh, joined some friends at, a, at an independent Bible church there in Princeton, Westerly Road. Uh, but the young man who died was an Episcopalian. And the Episcopal priest, who was the campus chaplain, had asked us to participated in a memorial service for him in the Princeton Chapel. And that was a, an introduction to me, or a reintroduction to, to the liturgy of the Episcopal Church, which I had a glancing familiarity with from childhood. And I went to see the, to the chaplain to find out, what do I do? I want to be baptized. How do I do this? And he, he agreed that baptism was possible, but my first question was, uh, why aren't Methodists, Presbyterians, and why aren't Anglicans Baptists, and why is it that the only thing all of them agree to is that they aren't Catholics? Mm -hmm. And he suggested that rather than puzzle that out from my experience backward, I go back to the beginning and come forward by reading the Fathers of the Church and try to sort this out and answer the fundamental questions about what does it mean to be a Christian? What are the consequences of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus? And I did. I began uh, to read the Fathers of the Church with the guidance of uh, people closer to our time, like okay. Cardinal Newman. Do right. um, you think that that uh, chaplain presumed that by... Did he have a hidden agenda? Did he presume that by you reading early fathers you would be convinced in your Episcopalianism? Oh, I suspect so. You know, like, okay. a, like a good uh, Anglican, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, all of this can be understood in a way that doesn't lead to 
priestly darkness to the okay. superstitions of Catholicism. You know, uh -huh. that there can be an enlightened, uh, reformed Christianity that appreciates those things. Which sounds like that other Newman. That's right. <laughs> but he uh, thought. You know, exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. But uh, it, it never stops there. It can't stop there. Yeah. Yeah. Was that then your, your beginning of your journey? Yes. For the, for the, the month that followed, uh, I followed the suggestion and continued to read and study and think uh, until July of 1982. And um, then I went back to my old friend Bob Royal and I said, okay, I'm ready. I want to be a Catholic. And up to that moment, I'd never met a priest. <laughs> and the only Catholic church I'd ever been in in my life was St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, where a classmate had taken me the previous year. Uh, so all of this up to that point was in my head okay. in many ways, okay. but it was the unfolding of the consequences of my, of my conversion to Christ, of my baptism. And so Bob said, yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll introduce you. And he sent me to see Father Peter Stravinskis, who was at the time living in Trenton, New Jersey. And I began with him to read uh, Father John Hardin's Catechism. Mm -hmm. Fine and book, which we highly recommend. Absolutely. To the audience. Still a very fine resource. And we did that throughout uh, July, August, September, October. And in the first week of November, I was received into full communion and confirmed. I'm thinking about the, um, the image that you had before, you know, that pit that you had dug, the image of the, of the renowned anti-God atheist, uh, did this quick change. Right. I mean, this is a, within a year and a half, this whole process happened, right? That's right. I mean, the right. awakening and all that. I mean, how did that sit with the folk that knew you before? Did you have to, what's that southern phrase about eat humble pie? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, in the aftermath of all that, of course, my friends from, from childhood, my classmates from high school said, we've been praying for you all these oh, years. Okay. We knew that, that you wouldn't stay an atheist, and they were filled with joy when I accepted Christ. Unfortunately, <laughs> when I began to move toward the Catholic Church, they were, many of them at least, not so happy. Uh, in their eyes, it was a step backwards. Uh, yeah. You know, at least an atheist doesn't vainly imagine he's a Christian. A Protestant who has doubts about the genuine <laughs> Christianity of Catholicism yeah. uh, then regrets to see a friend in Christ moving toward the Catholic Church. Yeah. What about your call to priesthood? I mean, how, how long did it take before you heard that? Immediately. Huh. You know, I suppose in retrospect, even from that moment when I was 13 and became an atheist, God was the preoccupation of my whole life. Even when I sought to deny his very existence, that was the, the central organizing idea of my life. And so when I finally surrendered my life to Christ and approached the church, uh, it was only natural. Uh, from the beginning, um, I suspected that I was called to the priesthood. Let me ask you this. There's a uh, a section in the beginning of 2 Corinthians that I've always found very meaningful. And I wondered if, in other words, connecting that early epiphany and the powerful of that, that would prepare you for what you're doing now. Right. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, we experience things that prepare us of course. specifically. Right. How, connect that to well, what you're doing now, to what, to what that early epiphany, which is 180 degrees in the other direction, to what you're doing now. What, what's the great uh, spiritual crisis of our time? Unbelief. The search for the grace of faith. Um, and so when people come to me, uh, struggling to believe um, for whatever reason, whether it's intellectual doubt or the experience of evil or a broken heart, struggling to believe. I understand. Hmm. I, I know from my own uh, twisted path to the throne of grace what it is not to believe and to grope in the dark. Hmm. And so uh, the experience of unbelief and of conversion and of surrender to the gospel, and of, of, of confident uh, surrender to Christ, all of that uh, in my own life has, hmm. has made me uh, a much more subtle instrument of grace in the priestly ministry for 
seekers. A couple other aspects of your journey remind me of things that uh, we really need to talk about evangelization. I mean, John Paul reminds us of our need for evangelization, and the danger is that we become very comfortable in our little places as Catholics, right. and we're called to evangelize. And a couple things from your journey remind me of, of key aspects of our of thinking about evangelization. One is this idea that, that conversion happens when we have a breach in the wall that surrounds our hearts. You know, we're like those old cities in the Old Testament that would build sure. these high walls, and if they're under siege, they're, they're safe. Right, and but then the walls are breached. Then there's a breach. And the danger is that when the walls of our, of our lives, we get this breach, that often people are going to grab the first thing that's on the other side of that wall. Right. So our need for evangelization is to surround people always. Right. It's not our job to cause the breaches. No, that's the work of grace, the Holy Spirit. That's right. But I looked at it in your life. I mean, to a certain extent, the death of that friend. Sure. No, I've pondered that many times in these 20 years. Um, yeah. the, the effect of his death. I, I can't say that I would be here, that I would be a priest, yeah. except that that man died at age 19. Yeah. Um, and when that breach opened, look at the things that were there. You had already started some of these aspects of the journey. That's right. That's right. And those people that had been praying for you all that time. I mean, those are messages to us that we ought to be praying for, never giving up on. Well, like St. Monica praying for Augustine's conversion. It's not fruitless. It may be years before you see the result. In fact, we may never see the result. Yeah. But we must continue to lift each other up to the throne of grace. And the work of evangelization, of course, begins with conversion. Yeah. Uh, this is how Christ begins yeah. his his public ministry in Mark's telling, yeah. the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Conversion and faith, a willingness to be changed by God's grace. Uh, an awful lot of uh, Catholics that uh, I've talked to or, or shared email with are not sure how to begin at their local parish level in terms of areas of evangelization. You know, the, there's an old sign on the Alaskan highway that used to say, pick your rut carefully, <laughs> you know, because the rut you choose, you'll be in for 200 miles. Okay, well, right. we get into ruts. It's hard to break right. free. Talk about your own parish and, and avenues of evangelization and growth that are taking place in your parish. Well, it would be uh, a mistake to say that we have a program of evangelization in the sense that we have an athletic program and um, uh, a, a program for caring for widows or those who are being married. Evangelization is the entire program. Yeah. Everything we do in some way serves the mission of spreading the gospel. Um, I have a full-time staff member whose title is Director of Discipleship and Evangelization, mm -hmm. who assists me in, in helping the parish be organized around this, this activity, this idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And of course, one of the problems we have in the Catholic Church is that vast numbers of people receive the sacraments without ever really receiving the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. They're brought to the font perhaps as babies and baptized and maybe even in some way haltingly catechized and then receive First Communion confirmation without ever really hearing and receiving the gospel. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you had to go through your life knowing what you knew at age 14 about anything. Yeah. And yet how many Catholics have a 14-year-old's understanding of the faith and who, who, who ceased after their confirmation to be offered the gospel in, an, in a systematic way? Yeah. So preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, explaining the gospel uh, in every conceivable forum um, is the most important thing. And you mentioned just recently during Lent, you've had some pretty large adult gatherings for scripture study, we, right? We had a uh, Sunday school class, the five Sundays of Lent. Uh, 275 people filled wow. up the parish hall See, each week. hungry yeah. there, that hunger there. Right. Another thing, and then we're gonna take a break, that reminds me about this need to evangelize is, is the need to close the sale. Right. You know, when I was a, a, a Protestant pastor, I closed the sale, and an awful lot of Catholics that no one closed the sale before, but that person did it with you, didn't he? That's right. Had you kneeled down and That's prayed right. with you. It's an invitation. Yeah. Come with me. 
You know, and, and it's Jesus speaking through us. Jesus saying, follow me through someone else. And I've uh, pointed to my own experience to my people regularly and said, it was a 19-year-old college boy who brought me to Jesus Christ. The vast majority of people will not hear the gospel from a priest or a religious, at least not for the first time. It will be from the baptized who need to understand their part in the mission of the church the Great Commission, to teach all nations, to spread the gospel. All right. Thank you, Father. Let's take a break. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Father J. Scott Newman. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Our guest this evening is Father Newman. Welcome to the program, and thank you, Father, for sharing. Uh, it's hard to summarize a whole life into <laughs> 20 minutes, and you did an excellent job. And I know we already have some phone callers and emails. Why don't we go with our <clears throat> first caller. This is Timothy from Utah. Hello, Timothy. What's your question tonight? Hello there. How are you? Just fine. Good, good. Well, my uh, father is about 72, maybe 73. And uh, I'm not sure if he was baptized or not, but he's um, never really been a... He's always been ag agnostic or atheist, as far as I can tell. I'm 35. My mother and I have gone to church regularly all of our lives, and he would come to Easter Mass or Christmas Mass. But um, I'm wondering how I could, um, I guess, uh, bring him to God before it's too late. If, you know, what's the way to approach it, you know? He's essentially the most intelligent man you can imagine. He's like Albert Einstein. He's a research scientist, um, one of those people who's too intelligent for his own good, you know. And I have no idea how to even just touch the subject or bring it up to him, you yeah. know, and I need some advice. All right. Thank you very much for your question. What do you think, Father? That's a tough case uh, for it two is. reasons. No man was, is, no prophet is without honor except in his native place. Meaning, you can't evangelize your own family. It's so hard. It's a very difficult thing to do, especially children to parents. Um, and, uh, you know, given the man's background in, in the natural sciences and the disposition to discount anything that can't be measured, quantified, um, perhaps uh, suggesting good books. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, in fact, I was going to say, I just read a wonderful book that a, a, a fine Catholic lady in Ireland sent me. I think she watches the program. It's a book called Understanding the Present. And I'm, I, from right now, I can't think of the last name of the, the British author. I think his last name is Apple, Applefield or Apple Yard or something like that. But it's, it's really examining scientific materialism and showing the dead end. Same thing with the, the books in the intelligent design movement, like Intelligent Design, yeah. the book written by William Dembski, an attempt mostly uh, by Christians to challenge the, the assumptions of scientific materialism uh, against uh, a designer and maker of all things. Now, it's a long way from the designer and maker of all things to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. The God of the philosophers is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob necessarily. So at some point you have to move from, from one part of the discussion to the next. You know, but uh, one other thing occurs to me. Um, where's the only place St. Paul enjoyed limited success in preaching? Athens. Why? Because he attempted to speak as a philosopher to philosophers. And when he got to Corinth, he realized the mistake. From now on, I will know only Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yeah. Sometimes it's as, it's as simple as, as saying, Dad, I want you to know something. Yeah. Um, I love you, uh, but I also love the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
and you need to understand, I want you to understand that this is the center of my life. And if you're interested, I'll be happy to tell you why I believe no human life, finally, is complete and adequate without a relationship with Jesus Christ. If I might just add one thing also, and that is that, you know, when you were describing your father, and to a certain extent, he would have sounded like how I might have described my own father at some point in our life. My father and I, I, I loved him dearly, but we didn't always were ain't always able to tell that to each other very well, and I didn't always know where he was with his faith. And he wasn't a churchgoer uh, when I was an adult, and he was an avid reader, read it all, and I may have described him in that way. But as we were talking earlier about that, the wall that we have around our hearts, and you know that it's the breach that can happen in a person's life that actually may look all negative, but it might be the very thing that the Spirit's using. For my dad, it was emphysema. And I know that that was one of the things in his later years that opened him up to hear the gospel. So never give up praying or sharing, as Father said. Serious illness, fear of death, um, th those can be uh, evangelical moments yeah. where you, you can speak simply and, and directly about the love of God in Christ. All right, thank you, Father. Let's take our next caller, since he's on the line, Derek from Indiana. Hello, Derek. What's your question for us tonight? Yes, I just wanted to say that God bless you, Father, because I can truly sympathize with exactly where you're coming from. I traveled down that exact same road, became very adept at being able to read the Bible, tear it apart, and use it to prove that it wasn't real. And it took me many, many years to get to the point where I could sit down and I could actually see where I personally was going wrong. And I was just wondering, was there one book out of the Bible or one particular passage that really centered in your mind as this conversion was going on? Thanks, Derek. Well, uh, um, I can't point to one uh, passage and say, this is what finally broke down my, my last remaining doubt. Yeah. As, I, as I already indicated, though, it was the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians that was the, the critical thing at that moment. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's just, it's a magnificent, yeah. from verses 3 to 10, uh, a simple, powerful exposition of the whole plan of salvation. It has pleased him to make known to us the mystery, the sacrament of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's a well-trod a well path. Yeah. You know, there are lots of us on that road who, who have this uh, relationship of antagonism to Christianity. Yeah. You know, and part of it is that the language of the gospel is so foreign to our ears until we learn to speak that language. When I was a boy, for example, listening to, to sweating preachers shout about uh, <laughs> needing to be saved, I, saved from what? <laughs> the simple idea of salvation needs to be explained to people of our time. Um, Especially we live in a culture that says there's no sin. I mean, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> exactly. Yet saved from what? You know. And sometimes, of course, the spirit can awaken that from within. But they, you know, we do need to. I would say to the caller, though, this: um, there's no substitute for direct uh, personal knowledge of the sacred scriptures. Um, lo other books are necessary. Many books are necessary. Um, but at the end of the day. It's only the Word of God which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's going to be direct personal, and that, that was what, as you say, closed the deal for me. Hmm. It was direct uh, personal contact with the Word of God. Hmm. Every page of sacred scripture, um, and for our purposes here, especially the whole New Testament, the Gospels, the letters of Paul, to hear God speaking to me individually, personally, uh, a word of salvation. All right. Thank you, Father. Let's just take this next email, and this will be an interesting question for you to ponder, uh, Father, given your, from your atheist perspective, and then for a time as a Calvinist, and then on into the Episcopal pers persuasion, and then in the Catholic Church. This comes from uh, Antoinette in Port Huron, Michigan. 
Hi, Marcus. Thank you for your show. My husband and I never miss it. We both learn so much from you and your guests. Thank you, Annette. Antoinette. My question, I often hear Christians, including Mother Angelica, say God has a plan for each of us and nothing happens by coincidence. I do not remember ever being taught anything like that as it sounds like predestination, which I know the church condemns. I'm not sure it does to a certain extent, but certain it depends aspects Depends on what of you it. mean by predestination. That's right. yeah. Here she goes on. Where would free will fit in if God has preordained everything? I would really appreciate an explanation for this belief. Thank you, Antoinette. You've got the atheist member, <laughs> you know, the, where is there any, right, right, so. Well, this is one of the great paradoxes uh, at the heart of the gospel. Um, the, the interplay between God's sovereignty and our freedom. Uh, this plan for each life we call providence. Um, that each one of us is brought into being from nothing as an individual person uh, by the will of God for a purpose and that purpose is to live for the praise of his glory mm. in this sense we all have the same purpose to live for the praise of his glory and to share that glory in Christ uh, how each individual person approaches that end is the question and there we have uh, the plan of God for our lives that nothing is random as as John Paul has said yeah. Uh, in the providence of God, there are no mere coincidences. Then comes the other dimension, which is human freedom. Uh, God is absolutely sovereign, and yet he does not force us in his sovereignty to accept his love, to accept his plan for our lives. Uh, if we're not free to say no, we're not really free to say yes. And then we're not children, we're slaves. And he doesn't desire slaves. The good news is, the divine persons of the Trinity created other persons who were not divine to share their glory. And in order to approach that, we must be free. Hmm. So it's both and. Yep. This paradox is resolved by in both and. I've not often said that one of the differences often between Catholic thinking and non-Catholic thinking is that as Catholics, because we believe in the mystery, we can be comfortable with, with the both and. We're often non-Catholic traditions struggle with that and always sure. end up with an either and or. Either faith or works. No, yeah. both faith and works yeah. Yeah. is another yeah. example. Is the mystery of that. Fine. Let's take our next caller, Donna from New Jersey. Hello, Donna. What's your question? For Hi, Marcus. Hi, Hello. Father. Uh, my question is, um, I'm a Lutheran, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of converting. All right. And I've been thinking about it for a while now. And uh, I've, read, I've been reading through the large Catholic catechism, and uh, trying to get some questions answered. But my main question is, uh, when it comes to the Holy Eucharist, um, and you refer to it as the species, and the body, blood, soul, and divinity, I believe a lot in the Lutheran churches I was brought up in and attend the same way you do. Some, I understand some Lutheran churches don't teach the same way. But... When I attend a Roman Catholic church, or I, I, de I decide to start looking for one or to support the one in my uh, vicinity, um, how could I receive both species, the, 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 the body and the blood, the, the bread and the, the wine, or the wafer and the wine? All right. So the question is about receiving under both kinds. Right. Well, the, uh, the Eucharist... Um, is uh, the real substantial presence of Christ in the sacrament under the appearance, which is what species means, under the appearance of bread and wine. Mm -hmm. These elements look to our senses, taste to our senses, to be bread and wine. In fact, they are not. After the celebration of the, of the Eucharist, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the complete reality of bread and wine, the substance, if you will, of the bread and wine is replaced by the reality, the substance of the flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus, now glorified uh, at the right hand of the Father. Um, because Christ is one and undivided, the Eucharist under either species, that is the bread or the wine, is the whole Christ. So when we receive either the host or the precious blood, it's the whole Christ we're receiving. So we're body and blood are both being communicated under either species. Receiving both 
is a fuller sign of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And th this, of course, was one of the great uh, debates in the 16th century. Yeah. Uh, the Lutherans insisted that, that the chalice had to be offered to the faithful in order for the Eucharist to be a complete act. The Council of Trent was prepared to offer, to restore the practice of, of uh, the extending the chalice to the people. It was only when it was denied that you could receive the whole Christ under either species that yeah. the church said no. And that's the, the significant issue, to emphasize that, right. that it wasn't the church denying the reception of both, but it was resisting the view that you must receive both right. to receive the full Christ, right? right? Exactly. That was the issue. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Which was, uh, is heresy. That's right. That's right. That you have to have both. That's right. Okay. All right, so today it's an option. It's still not, uh, you know, we haven't moved so far in the church to, to, for people to say that you must. That you must, no. Well, it's, right. it's, it's an option offered under specified circumstances, depending on the nature of the celebration uh, of the yeah. Eucharist. Um, and, and I think in most parishes today, it's common that, the, that uh, the Eucharist is distributed under both kinds at Holy Communion. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least one of the Masses on right. a Sunday. Right, usually the more solemn Mass. That's right. All right, let's take our, our email. This comes from Ray Conrad in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, Father Newman, our parish has one catechumen coming into the church via RCI this year. He was asked to sign a book at our parish yesterday. He will be baptized, confirmed, and, and receive the Eucharist at the Easter Vigil. I recall that baptisms are recorded in a bound book and kept in a safe at the rectory. Could you comment on the significance of becoming an elect? And why is his election so significant, and why is it recorded? I know his three sacraments will be recorded. He's not yet baptized, but is now a member of the church. So the significance of the elect. Okay. There are two different books that he's referring to here. One is the baptismal register, and he's correct. Every parish keeps one of these. It should be kept in a fireproof safe. Uh, it's one of the most important documents in every parish. Hmm. For the rest of your life, when you yeah. come to get married or ordained or... You, and you need a baptismal certificate, you go back to the parish of your baptism and, and there are the records. In fact, if we want to find out information about a great, 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 great grandfather, exactly. we look for a baptismal record. For baptismal records. records. Right. Um, the other book is the Book of the Elect, and that's a completely different uh, mm -hmm. document. This is part of the, of the reconstituted rite of Christian initiation of adults. Um, and uh, having those who are to be baptized sign their names in the book of the elect, of those chosen, that is, by Christ, called to, yeah. to faith and to baptism and to membership in the church by Christ the Lord. Having them sign their name in the book is a different thing than recording the fact later of their baptism. The, the book of the elect is a ceremonial book. It's not a sacramental or canonical register of any sort. And its, it's uh, significance is primarily symbolic. It's a, a public acknowledgement on the part of those preparing for baptism, that yes, I commit myself uh, as a disciple of Christ the Lord. I'm requesting from the church the sacrament of baptism and, and certify by my signature here that I, as they will uh, uh, say at the Easter Vigil who have already been baptized, that I believe and profess all that the Catholic Church teaches and believes to be revealed by God. So it's one of those symbolic steps along the way of committing themselves step right. by step That's to right. fully come into the church and receive the, the sacraments. All right. <clears throat> Let's take our next caller, Nelson from Florida. Hello, Nelson, uh, what's your question? Good evening. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is, um, while you were reading the church fathers, did you consider um, the Orthodox Church? And if you did, why did you choose the Catholic? And the following that is, how did you deal with the dogma of papal infallibility? Thank you. I'll take your answers off the air. Thank you, okay. Nelson. Question one. No, I never seriously considered orthodoxy. And, and for me, it was, it was almost um, self-evident. Um, Eastern Christianity is for Eastern people. Um, I'm, I'm a child of the West. All of my ancestors are from the British Isles. Uh, it never occurred to me... Uh, to be drawn to the to the Christian East, um, uh, and at no point in reading the Fathers did I feel compelled to ask, "Is that an option?" and then close the answer to that question. Okay. Um, 
how did I resolve the doctrine of papal infallibility? I, I, I never quarreled with it. <laughs> a, a, after, as I was groping my way toward Catholicism, it became increasingly clear to me um, that uh, the church of the first century, the church of the second century, the church of the third century, brought forward to our time is the Catholic Church. That uh, to be in full communion with the church founded by Jesus, to be a part of the church fully and rightly ordered through time, uh, as Father Newhouse is fond of saying, requires that I be in communion with a bishop who is in communion with the Bishop of Rome. That the church is a communion of communions, and apart from being in communion with the Bishop and Church of Rome, something essential to the Christian life is missing. And then the next question is, how does the Bishop of Rome exercise his ministry uh, within the College of Bishops? The charism of infallibility the spiritual gift of infallibility is confided to the whole church, not just to the Pope, to the whole church. And that gift of infallibility is then exercised by the sacred teaching office of the bishops, the whole college of bishops who succeed the apostles. And within the college, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope acting as head, is capable of using that gift under certain conditions and in extraordinary ways but never apart from the entire college. In other words, it's a mistake to try to grapple with the question of papal infallibility without understanding the promise of the Lord Jesus that he would send the Holy Spirit who would lead us into all truth. Right. And that this, the exercise of this gift is uh, within the College of Bishops. And that within the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome has a unique role to play. To imagine somehow that the doctrine of, of infallibility confers some kind of monarchy on, on the papacy is to misunderstand the point in fundamentally. That's right. All right, let's, uh, let's try to get one more email in before our final break. This comes from Oscar in Ohio, Marcus and Father Newman. Thanks for another great program. One of the arguments I have heard from non-Christian is, quote, the Bible can't be true because it is full of all kinds of contradictions, end of quote. And the other big one, quote, Christianity can't be true because Christians themselves can't agree on what Christ taught, end of quote. Having possibly used these yourself as an earlier age, how would you answer them now? Thank well, you, Oscar. Let me take them in reverse order. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, divisions among Christians is an impediment to the spread of the gospel. In the high priestly prayer the night before he died, recorded in chapter 17 of John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus prays for the unity of those who believe in him, that the world may believe that he was sent by the Father. Yeah. Our, our unity of faith and charity is, in other words, one of the convincing witnesses to the truth of the gospel. And when that unity is impaired, our ability to bear witness to the gospel is diminished. Absolutely. Uh, which is why the church is committed irrevocably to searching for the restoration of full visible communion among all who confess Jesus Christ as Lord. The first question. Uh, how can the Bible be true if it contains contradiction? The first thing that has to be said is the Bible is not a book, it's a library. And it's a library uh, composed over a thousand years um, in, in languages uh, and cultures that are absolutely alien to us today. It's not possible to pick up an English translation of the Bible and encounter the English text and be sure that we're reading what's really there and understanding it correctly. So trying to sort out what scripture says requires first encounter with the original languages, knowledge of the culture and the context of, of what's written, and then identifying things like what is the literary genre here? The, the love poetry of Song of Songs is not the same thing as uh, the wisdom literature is not the same thing as the Gospel of Mark. Um, Next, it's necessary to understand that the Bible is not a science text. Uh, it, it, yeah. is, it is not in the sense that we would now say it's not a history text, although there is science and history in the Bible. Um, what the church believes is that because God is the principal author, the first author of every page of Scripture, um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the human 
authors who cooperate with grace to confide to writing in human language the word of God. For this reason, the scripture is preserved from error in faith and morals. That is, what we must know and do to be saved. Um, our human authors of the scripture say uh, the, the history text of the Old Testament, capable of making mistakes, saying um, 17,500 were killed in the battle when in fact it was 18,500. And does this falsify in any way the meaning of sacred scripture? And the answer is no. But seeing how that's so requires a, uh, a rather sophisticated understanding of the nature of inspiration, uh, the origin of the text, the, the, the canon of scripture, and how all the parts fit together in a whole. Uh, in fact, I want to encourage the audience, if you want more questions about the church's view on Scripture, look at the Catechism. There's a fine description in the Catechism about how we interpret Scripture, how we understand the relationship of sacred tradition and sacred Scripture, how it was inspired and how it came about. And the, the dogmatic constitution of the Second Vatican Council on That's Divine right. Revelation, Dei Verbum. It's a simple, Excellent. accessible text. Anybody can read it. It's available in pamphlet form. It's on the Vatican website. Uh, uh, and it's a wonderful introduction to these questions. I'll tell you, instead, instead of going to a break, Father, talk about uh, also this book by George Weigel and its relationship to your own <laughs> pastoral ministry. Well, you're referring to, uh, to a new book called Letters to a Young Catholic, uh, written by George Weigel, just out this month from, from Basic Books. Um, George has written uh, a, a lovely meditation on... Uh, the face of Catholicism, how, how to make Catholic Christianity comprehensible to a young adult at the threshold of the 21st century. And over 14 essays, he, he tries to cast light on things that are easily misunderstood about Catholicism. And in each essay, uh, written as a letter to an to a anonymous correspondent, there's a, an illustration of an idea uh, by a person or a place or a thing like the Sistine Chapel or Shark Cathedral or Flannery O'Connor's uh, literature. And in the chapter on liturgical prayer, the whys and hows of uh, praying in the sacred liturgy, um, George used as an illustration uh, my little parish in Greenville, <laughs> uh, which tells me that George needs uh, a better class of clerical friends <laughs> and wider experience <laughs> of parish life. But uh, uh, St. Mary's is, is an extraordinary little corner of the vineyard. You know, there aren't many Catholics in South Carolina. We constitute about 3.5% of the population. Um, but our parish was founded in 1852. It was the first uh, Catholic church in the 12 counties that constitute what we call the upstate, the Piedmont region of South Carolina. And uh, in the 151 years since then, uh, we have been blessed in many ways of a beautiful uh, campus in downtown Greenville, a thriving congregation, uh, and a splendid experience of liturgical prayer each Sunday when the, when the Eucharist is celebrated, most especially the solemn Mass at 11 o'clock. And um, in attempting to make comprehensible the nature of liturgy, George uses that as an example. Father, thank you so much, and thank you for your witness to Christ, both in, about your conversion and your work as a priest. Could you close the program by giving us a blessing? Certainly. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Newman, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Marcus. for joining us, uh, for such a clear witness to us and a challenge to us. And I, I think it reminds all of us Catholics to keep learning our faith so we can uh, be a witness to those around us because we never know when that breach might happen. And in fact, their heart might be opened to hear the fullness of the truth. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure. Keep Mother Angelica and the sisters and EWTN in your prayers because it's only by the work of the Holy Spirit and your generosity that we're able to bring these programs to you. God bless. I'll see you again next week.